Hi, I'm Steve Hargadon, and welcome to our post-conference keynote from the Gaming and Ad Conference. Michael Levine is here. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Such a pleasure, Steve. Good afternoon. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thanks to Brain Pop and ASB Online as the conference sponsors. Thanks to Blackboard <coughs> Collaborate for their also stable platform. This is a learning revolution project. We appreciate you joining us either live or by watching the recording. So there are some of you in the live room here. Click on the star to the left of the map and then click on the map. You can let us know where you're participating from. It's fun for you to put something in the chat. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, where we had threatened rain today, but it didn't actually fully materialize. Ron, I think you make us international just by yourself. So good to have you, Ron. <laughs> Go ahead and keep those notes going in the chat. It is fun for those of you who are here to to know each other and to be able to chat with each other. Is the sound okay? The sound is great. Michael, I'm going to turn this over to you. Great. I'm your wingman. Just let me know how you can help, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up when you're done. Thanks, Steve, and hi, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to participate in the regularly scheduled keynote, but it's so nice of, of Steve and colleagues to allow me to participate. Now I had a family health crisis, which actually is much better now, so it's, it's really good to be speaking to all of you. Um, my name is Michael Levine. I'm the executive director of the Young Gans Community Center, and today I want to speak about one of the latest rages in, in tech circles. Most of you know about games-based learning. Uh, you've heard from pioneers in this space uh, on the Gaming and Education Channel over the past two weeks, and I'm excited to be able to share the work of the Joan Gans Kenny Center here at Cessna Workshop in New York. As we consider an exciting moment in the history of education reform and the role that new forms of digital innovation can play, there is, however, one big caution flag I want to raise. While there's new evidence of efficacy and new indicators of demand, is games-based learning or GDL ready for prime time? Is it a pathway, as many have argued, for sustained impact or disruptive innovation? Or is games-based learning at risk of disappearing into the ether, like many tech-based reforms of the past? Can this form of media development have a similar impact on the field as, whoops, that is, that is not my slide. <laughs> Where am I? This is great. This is not my presentation. Oh, it just got misordered. Well, OK, here we go. Um, can this form of media development have a similar impact on the field as the revolutionary work that a band of furry Muppets had on children's media when it was created some um, four decades ago? Um, I work at an R&D center named for Sesame Street's founder, Joan Gans Cooney. Many of you have heard of her remarkable achievements over the years. She was an innovator for the analog world. Uh, our center examines the potential of digital media in both formal and informal learning environments. We do research on underserved kids and build learning models for kids at risk. We try our hardest to shape policy agendas and generally have fun looking at which media innovations might have the biggest positive impact on society. The center was established in 2007, and here you see just a little bit about how the landscape in digital innovation has changed. I don't need to tell any of you who are listening today about how rapidly the digital media landscape has changed since 20, you know, 2007, from the invention of the iPad less than four years ago to the immersive 3D motion capture and wearable technologies of the past few years. Here's an overview of the work of the Kinney Center. We focus, uh, some of you may know, on three big areas, um, the ways families use media for learning, both together and alone, the promise of technologies to promote children's foundational and 21st century literacy skills, and the role that games may be playing in promoting effective teaching and learning practices we do so with a wide range of strategies from supporting and conducting research to creating tools and prototypes for practitioners and parents. The investment and program landscape has moved so rapidly as new platform innovations have taken hold. EdTech, as you all know, is a significant market 
new brands for personalized learning, like Khan Academy, as they exploded on the scene in recent years. And games as an activity and as a service have taken off across every demographic. But we're facing a big, big challenge. Ed tech and games in particular are hot, but the evidence of impact is now only warming up. Educators and parents think that games have limited value, even as the latest academic analyses show that GBL can, under the right circumstances, offer a big cognitive boost. Why should we care about games? Well, first of all, they're ubiquitous. A nine-year-old spends almost an hour a day playing games, and that's twice as much as your average six-year-old. So at the Kennedy Center, we're documenting these trends in numerous reports. You may be familiar with some of these. They're all available free of charge at CuneyCenter.org. Here are a few of the studies that we've done to cull down the research on games and other digital technologies to try and address whether their potential is strong and to sort out the substance from the hype. Teachers and parents, according to national surveys we've been following, are not yet playing along. They're expressing some healthy skepticism and ambivalence. Sometimes they see games, as you see in this slide, as kind of a time dump. Seven in 10 teachers feel that entertainment media like games have hurt students' focus. And six in 10 parents say video games have a negative effect on their children's physical activity. But on the other hand, they like games for building children's social and problem solving skills. And innovative teachers like Joel Levin, pictured here with his uh, students uh, in New York. Joel's also known as the Minecraft teacher. Many of you know that he's gone to work at Elon Media as uh, the developer of something called Minecraft EDU. These teachers are taking advantage of the unique features that games provide in the classroom. Let's see if we can take a look at his work for a few minutes by clicking on this link. Is the link here. Are you wanting me to show the video now? Yes, please. I'm going to put the link to the video on the chat. I'm going to run it in a web tour. If it doesn't start up for you automatically in the web tour, then click on that link in the chat. Great. Thank you, Steve. My name is Joel Evans. Uh, and I work here at the Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School in New York City. I'm a, uh, both a technology integrator and a computer teacher. I'm a both a technology integrator and a computer teacher. My students are great. They're uh, you know seven, eight uh, years old, and uh, have. Michael, I turned your microphone off, so you're going to have to turn it back on because we were hearing the video through your mic. Click on the talk button below. The so image thanks so much, everybody, for go. viewing that. It's that that's one of a series of different uh, videotapes that we've been developing here at the CUNY Center, and I'll show you later a new series on the use of games in professional development that will be of interest, I think, to some of members of the audience, not all of you. Um, to get a much deeper understanding of what's going on since um, surveys of teachers and um, pioneers like, you know, Joel are not necessarily typical of what's going on in classrooms, and surveys of parents have found significant ambivalence in the use of games we're learning, we conducted a new study that will be released actually just in two weeks. Um, it's called Level Up Learning, and this is a sneak preview of the National Survey of Teaching with Digital Games. Some of you may follow our work on the gamesandlearning.org site where you've seen some other sneak peeks of this over the last couple of months. Um, the 2014 National Teachers Survey on Games-Based Learning is covering five timely topical areas. Um, we are looking at technology utilization. Has technology being used in 
classrooms of uh, teachers K-8. Uh, we are developing profiles on which teachers are using games and how in their teaching. We'll be sharing some of the research on best practices or emerging best practices, how digital games are being used in instruction, um, observations and perceptions of who's benefiting, and the barriers, sort of the opportunities and challenges to using games in instruction. And as I suggested, there are five new video case studies in addition to the one you just saw, and you'll see me speak on one of them in a few moments that closely look at teacher practices and innovative programs. Here are the demographic data on the survey of some 700 teachers, grades K-8, of whom uh, over 500 use digital games. You'll see that most of them are concentrated in the K-5, to and about half of them teach in Title I schools in low-income areas. And here's a sneak peek of the data that we'll soon release. Um, first, you see in this slide that teachers are most influenced, no surprise, by their peers in selecting games for, for learning in their classrooms, followed closely by whether or not the game includes embedded assessments or other classroom management features. About 40% report that a game must have strong research claims for them to deploy it. Um, this slide shows that um, nearly 8 in 10 of all teachers who use games use them to assess teachers' uh, students' performance in some way. And this one shows that of this group, over half use built-in assessments to make instructional decisions or to understand student mastery of the subject at the end of the unit. And, you know, in terms of which devices students are typically using to access digital games in their classroom, more teachers, I guess not surprisingly, are using desktop computers than interactive whiteboards or tablets when accessing digital games, but we do anticipate that tablets will become much more prominent in the near future. And in contrast to our earlier video of um, Joel Levin's work with Minecraft, a commercial game that now is being developed um, through the sale to Microsoft for all sorts of different purposes, I'm sure, over 8 in 10 of our teachers reported using educational games in the classroom as compared to ones designed for strictly entertainment. And these are the genres that they're using. Educational games, especially puzzle and trivia games, are most popular. And these are some of the most frequently cited games that teachers report using in the classroom. Content-specific games focusing on literacy and math rule the roost. And, you know, many of you will recognize some of these very, very popular titles, whether it's Starfall for early literacy or Brain Pop, which is ubiquitous in many, many different elementary and middle schools around the country where Cool Math, Free Rice, or Pop, Tropica, Pop, Pop Tropica are all popular titles here in the U.S. and around the globe. The role that games are playing in the classroom and the technologies used to prepare teachers to integrate games in the classroom are, I think, becoming increasingly sophisticated. In this slide and in this video, we're going to go inside a unique professional development experience at Teach Live, which is based at Central Florida University, not ASU, sorry about that, to see here what beginning educators are learning about the power of games and simulations to encourage reflective practices. This is one example of how we're beginning to gamify and add artificial intelligence and simulations to professional development uh, practices. and. Uh, Steve, if you can play this uh, video, I'd be grateful. Absolutely. Thank you. So go ahead and turn your microphone off again this time. I'll put the link in the chat. If you have trouble seeing it, I'm going to fire up the web tour.
So thanks, Steve. So that's an example of the new series of video case studies that will be released next week with generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on our um, new website, gamesandlearning.org. I'd love to hear in the discussion period whether any of you have discovered that resource yet. Um, so to help teachers discover a wide range of resources available for professional development and classroom application, later this fall we'll be releasing in conjunction with the MindShift NPR blog at KQED in San Francisco, a new guide to using games in schools written by Temple University professor and Forbes Games and Learning blogger Jordan Shapiro. The guide is a kind of a soup to nuts review of new ways to use games in the classroom and will help, I think, expand on folks' knowledge in this space. We're covering recent research, interviews with experts, and lots of advice for selecting and implementing games for classroom use. So now that we're getting a better sense of not only how teachers are using games, but how parents are perceiving their use as well, shouldn't we better understand what the evidence of efficacy is for their use? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the evidence and ways to reduce the hype around games-based learning. Luckily, some of the nation's leading research scientists are on top of this issue. Two and a half years ago, the National Academy of Sciences released its panel study on the uses of games and simulations to remote mastery of science content. And of course, they concluded, as most of us bodies of researchers does or do, more research is needed in three important areas, the role of simulations and games, the ways in which they can be used to bridge learning across formal and informal contexts, and the ways in which they can be used to support uh, assessment and personalized learning. Last year, as a follow-on to that National Academy panel study, Stanford Research International, SRI, released one of those needed studies, this one of meta-analysis of 77 experiments analyzing the academic gains connected to games-based learning on STEM subjects. The study found great potential for games and even greater possibilities for driving STEM knowledge through simulations. This analysis, however, did not focus on non-academic subjects and skills, and many scholars, including some members of my team here at the Community Center, believe that this is a vital next frontier <clears throat> for exploration. In addition to the slow but now accumulating knowledge base connected to games-based learning, what other factors make widespread adoption either difficult or, in some cases, premature? I would cite two factors from this slide as especially difficult to surmount. First, as the SRI study ably documented, current research efforts are often fragmented and are not robust enough to capture multidisciplinary knowledge. And second, and this is really vital, the underlying public will, as expressed in my earlier slides about parent and teacher ambivalence, to support games-based learning is still tentative and perhaps even lacking in many respects. So what do I suggest be done to build more of the professional and public consensus to move games-based learning from kind of an unproven phase into the learning mainstream and ready to scale? Well, first, and here, here's five ideas that I'd like to put to the community listening. First, I suggest we start early. Those of us who work with uh, experts at the Sesame Workshop and other learning experts know that preschool isn't too early. We need to recognize developmentally appropriate cautions against media use, which are legitimate, while building strong digital literacy beginning at age four. New guidelines from the National Association for the Education of Young Children are a really good starting point. Second, we need to use games embedded failure states and levels to align success metrics and engaging digital experiences with the common core state standards and next generation learning standards. 
Third, I think it's important, it's vital, to modernize teacher capabilities by retraining every educator in America to use digital tools more effectively in transforming their practices. Arizona State University's James Paul G and I have written about the need for a capacity building digital teacher core and the importance of moving away from short form drill and practice efforts to more immersive, deeper learning possibilities. Jim talks a lot about big G and little g. Some of you are familiar with that concept. Fourth, it's time to prioritize special research themes that will, at least theoretically, have the greatest potential impact. I like three areas I'd like to suggest where games-based learning might make a very interesting difference. First, we need to think more about lifelong or intergenerational learning and the ways in which Families can use media together, as well as peers using media together, not in parallel play, but in integrated play. Second, I think it's extremely important that we focus on the wide word gap that exists among middle class and low income kids beginning in early childhood. Games can actually encourage active participation in closing that gap. And then third, I think this emphasis on non-cognitive skills, like what Angela Duckworth and her colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania have referred to as grit and tenacity, which seem to predict success in a global and digital economy. We also need to embrace the maker movement with more gusto, asking developers and educators to encourage kids to make their own games and their own digital learning displays. With our colleagues at Eline Media, the Entertainment Software Association, the Smithsonian and the Institute for Museum and Library Services, we will announce on October 15th or so the fourth National STEM Video Game Challenge, which was launched by President Obama in 2011. This challenge, more details can be found at www.stemchallenge.org, allows youth and their mentors to create and publish educational games and win prizes for their schools and further education efforts. To begin to address some of these challenges and opportunities, let me wrap up with a few slides about the Games and Learning Publishing Council, which is a project of the CUNY Center and many others with support from the Gates Foundation. In order to help build both public and practitioner demand and to raise the bar for smarter investments in product development, we have created this council. The GLPC connects experts from across publishing, children's media, research policy, and investment with the intention of repositioning games for learning and promoting best practices among educators and developers. You can see some of the organizations that are, involving, that are involved in the sector raising work here on the bottom. To help aggregate knowledge, recently we launched a new web community called gamesandlearning.org, all of whose, whose offerings are free. Our ambition is to serve as an honest broker for games-based learning. And the council is also promoting others' great work, often through that site. And I encourage you to explore the work of the Glass Lab through at SimCity EDU and many other tools that are being created for educators and researchers. The Learning Game Networks recently, actually just in the last weeks, release of the immersive learning game Radix and Common Sense Media's new games-based learning rating systems, for example, which is called Graphite. These are all examples of great new resources for educators that you can learn about through gamesandlearning.org. Digital games, I would conclude, are already a major force in tens of millions of young people's lives. The next five years will likely determine if GDL is here to stay or whether the promise so many advocates are suggesting remains unfulfilled. The community assembled here listening today will have a good deal of influence on that outcome. It's been a pleasure sharing some of our research and my perspective and I'd love to hear from you and I'm ready to take your questions and comments. Thanks for listening this afternoon. Thanks, Michael.
So we have a question from Michael. You can uh, raise your virtual hand. It's the third icon over in the participant window, or you can put your question in the chat. Uh, Peggy wanted to know if there are some schools currently conducting action research projects on using games for learning. Yeah. Um, thanks, Peggy. Uh, yeah, there's many many um, schools that are you know part of networks that are interested in games-based learning. Um, one network has been convened by Digital Promise, which is a public-private partnership between the U.S. Department of Education, Aspen Institute, and others. They have a League of Innovative Schools that is looking at all sorts of new and novel uses of um, of, 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 uh, of games in, in the classroom. There are also other research projects that are underway, uh, testing individual you know games. Um, there's a very very interesting research network which perhaps if they're still on board here, uh, Classroom Inc. has created uh, through its use of a game called the the Sports Network, and they're conducting research that's very very valuable. Uh, across different sites uh, this past summer, uh, using that game and that sort of you know simulation activity, there are net, there's a network that the Gates Foundation is supporting, which consists of uh, different scholars from uh, University of uh, UCLA and Florida State University. I can follow up with you uh, separately, Peggy. Just send me an email at michael.levine at sesame.org, and I'll send you some other resources on this topic. Michael, I think back to Seymour Papert, uh, open source software, Web 2.0. It does feel as though these technologies come, and part of the reason they're so attractive is because they involve participation, activity, and and learning as a creative act. Uh, is the concern that when you when you look so careful about whether or not games and learning will be games will be a part of learning, is your concern that it will get somehow co-opted or yeah. uh, reduced? Yeah, such a good question. So um, uh, Stephen has asked, you know, how can we use games in their sort of unique attributes as opposed to, I think, uh, just, you know, put old wine in new bottles. What I fear from the research that we've been doing, the teachers in particular that I previewed here today, Steve, is that a lot of the work that's being done, and um, lots of experts are commenting on this as well, uh, a lot of the work that's being done in classroom are short form games, drill and practice, let's just, you know, take a little, you know, a little break from the action and reward the, the student with, you know, five minutes of something that's that's just fine, but it doesn't immerse the, the child or the youth in a series of activities that are really going to extend their learning. So um, what I'm seeing is that these short form games or these, you know, little applets or different things that are being used as rewards or ways to encourage engagement are, there's nothing harmful about them, but they don't really change the practice. They don't really shake things up. They don't really offer the kind of immersive learning that you saw available, for example, in what Joel Levin is doing with Minecraft or what you see in the kinds of, you know, really, really best practices with things like Radix or Classroom, you know, Inks, um, you know, simulation and, um, you know, career development games. So I'm very, very hopeful that we'll find a way to integrate the more thoughtful, longer form, more immersive, more metacognitive developing games that are being created these days. But I'm worried that we will um, do what you know comes easiest, which is to just slip three or five minutes of a reward into the system. Does, does it is it helpful at all to distinguish between? A concept of integration and a concept of sort of rethinking how education takes place um, is part of the difficulty that we do try and integrate these into a system which largely is still kind of structured on non-participation, conformance, compliance kinds of models. I think so. I mean, I wouldn't say that all classrooms follow that model, but I do think that there's a lot of pressures on teachers these days to whatever they add needs to have kind of, you know, proof of impact on some sort of a assessment bottom line. Um, so I, I think that, one, we do need to embed and integrate. And I think we have some new tools to be able to do that. You see some of those things um, being, you know, featured in my presentation just in terms of the ways in which teachers can begin to reflect on their own, you know, practices through things like the Teach Life system. So there are ways of integrating and disrupting 
uh, at the same time. Um, Steve, so I, I do think that we need a new think in terms of how, you know, project-based learning becomes much more important in classrooms and that kids themselves have much more agency in the things in which they create, produce, distribute, share. Um, and all that, I think, is part of a 21st century learning model that is just gaining speed. But at the same time, I think that there are approximate steps that can be taken both in teacher professional development but also in using games for assessment in a way that will be quietly disruptive and that may not transform the classroom but are moving them inch by inch in the right direction. So I think it's probably appropriate to read Joe's question right now. He says, to what extent do you see the gamification of curriculum and classroom management producing good learning outcomes? How can do gamification of curriculum efforts affect public opinion? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable completely, Joe, with how gamification is often used. I mean, lots and lots of things are gamified, um, you know, in our lives. And I just want to be careful about the, the use of that. I mean, that said, we don't have enough solid evidence yet about the kinds of games or gamification that are going forward in terms of the outcomes that they are fetching. The research that I cited in my uh, in my presentation from SRI is very, very notable. In this regard, there are certain conditions under which academic outcomes of a particular variety are supported according to that meta-analysis, but the larger ways in which we need to change classrooms to be um, more distributed in terms of learning and to focus on non-academic, non-cognitive skills is still largely unproven by some of these gold standard, you know, research projects that I described. So I think the jury's a little bit out on whether or not the learning outcomes themselves are are better than the learning outcomes that would come from just powerful pedagogies that don't use digital learning objects like games. All of that said, I do think that there are unique attributes of games that we're picking up. The issue of engagement, the the issue of authentic real-time, clever, and immediate feedback is extremely important. And I think the possibilities for games to both uh, vary instruction and personalize instruction for kids who may be, you know, more vulnerable or more expert um, uh, in, in, in sort of, you know, getting to the next stage of their own learning and development. I think there are unique affordances that are not being well deployed uh, and research on learning theory and the kinds of ways in which we need to personalize and distinguish instruction does show that there is a good match for some of the more immersive, more the better researched gains that I described earlier in my presentation. Jury's out, but we can begin to change practice in certain respects. Okay, we have a, a couple more minutes. If you have a question for Michael, you can raise your virtual hand or you can put it in the chat. And I want to just re remind people that the Kinney Center does work very, very, very assiduously to feature other people's good work. We're a collaboratory. We, of course, conduct our own research and we're involved in all sorts of different research and practice alliances. But we encourage those of you who are working in this field to one, critique what we're doing and comment on it. Two, if you have your own work that you would like us to promote or to give you a voice, that's what we're here for. We publish other people's comments and opinions. We're actively seeking other folks' research, and we're ready to interview you and gain your perspective and give you a bit of a megaphone for your perspective. We don't think that there are too many settled knowledge bits in this area, and so we're at a stage where everybody's perspective is important to share. I'm sure Michael would appreciate us the additional free 15 minutes in his day. So I'm going to close this up. If there aren't any more questions in the chat, or if anyone wants to raise the hand, Peggy is clapping. It's hard to find the clapping icon. But if That's you're a good icon. Thank you. Window, and you go down to the smiley face, click on applause. You're Thank you. Clapping. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Well, I, can also I can also personalize my thanks. Wonderful. Yes. 
And I know once again, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for providing this opportunity. And I want to make it just genuinely known that I'm open to feedback. Michael.Levine at sesame.org. Check out pinnycenter.org and gamesandlearning.org. And we really do appreciate your spreading your, the word about what we do well and commenting to us privately about what we don't do so well. So thanks, Steve, for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, really fun to, to, to throw back to the conference. Uh, delighted to, to be able to do that today. The recording of the session will be up in about five minutes uh, in full Blackboard Collaborate form, the MP3 and MP4. That's game-like game -like laser feedback. Terrific. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Okay, thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.